Welcome back to another video here on the channel. Some of you might have heard it already, I founded a company. The company's name is Lit Products, Lit being another word for cool or awesome, and Lit is also simply my name spelled backwards. So I want to talk at least a little bit about this today, as it fits in nicely with the main subject of the video, which is Paul Jarvis' book Company of One. The subtitle of the book already gives you a good idea what it is about, why staying small is the next big thing for business. A company of one is not necessarily a company that consists of just one person. The number one is more of a metaphor describing small. A company of one is simply a business that questions growth. This of course doesn't mean that growth is inherently bad or that the company should never grow. It just instead questions growth, meaning it thinks about what growth really means and what potential negative effects can really come from growth. I found that definition quite interesting, because just the day before I read an essay by Paul Graham that is literally titled Startup Equals Growth. A startup is a company designed to grow fast. Being newly founded does not in itself make a company a startup. The only essential thing is growth. Everything else we associate with startups follows from growth. So I guess a company of one is not a startup. While a growth targeting startup consumes every second of your life, a company of one is quite the opposite. If you're a company of one, your mindset is to build your business around your life, not the other way around. This take is very similar to what we talked about in the videos on minimalist entrepreneurship. Very few people have the goal of building a billion or even trillion dollar business. I recently talked about this with Jonas from the German podcast Bitcoin Verstehen, who watched my minimalist entrepreneurship video and felt like it spoke to him. If his podcast becomes a way to finance his life by doing something he's deeply curious about while having complete autonomy, that's all he wants. This is a much more healthy and overlooked component of entrepreneurship in my opinion. These type of businesses are also often referred to as lifestyle businesses. Paul Graham has a great term for one of these stages of a company. He calls it ramen profitable, as ramen is extremely cheap. This of course doesn't have to be the end goal because it definitely doesn't mean any financial independence, but it's a huge milestone if your own business can keep you afloat. Ramen profitable means a startup makes just enough to pay the founders living expenses. Once you cross over into ramen profitable, it completely changes your relationship with investors. It's also great for morale. Another similarity I found between this book and Zahil's book is that both agree on the idea of out-teaching and out-sharing your competition. This is something I want to practice myself. Maximum transparency. I will operate my newly founded company in an open startup matter, meaning maximum transparency, sharing everything I can. From what I work on to actual revenue and customer numbers, expenses and profit, I will also share how I am trying to build the company, the challenges I am facing and everything else I learn on the way. If I don't achieve any success with anything I am building, but help others to do so, I think this is an achievement in and of itself. As Balaji said, win and help win. Moving people up the ownership hierarchy and turning more of them into autonomous creators and founders is very important to me. If you are interested in this, you can subscribe to my second channel that I am starting for this purpose. The link is in the video description. Don't expect any content for at least a month or so, as I'm still in a transition phase from my previous occupation. Most of all, the company will be the home and legal framework to my side projects. More on that in the future. Now back to the actual book. This is the most fundamental starting point. Getting better instead of bigger. Every argument follows from there. And getting better instead of bigger makes intuitive sense if you think from a customer perspective. In the end, a business is only successful if it has customers that pay for the product. If you would ask your customers how to make them happier, no one would answer by growing your company. Growth would mean less focus and dedication to that specific customer. Making the service or product better is really the way to go to make your customers happy. So it makes sense from a customer's perspective, but it actually makes just as much sense from a business perspective. Because winning new customers is a lot more expensive than keeping existing customers. Long-term customer relationships and retention should be the primary goal in a company of one. According to the eConsultancy Responses Cross-Channel Marketing report, adding a new customer costs five times as much as keeping an existing one. So while prioritizing acquisition over retention can aid growth, it's also extremely expensive. The same study found that companies are still much more likely to put their efforts into finding new customers than keeping existing ones. Making the small amount of customers you have really happy also trickles down into other areas. They tell others. This is the most powerful and actually somewhat free customer acquisition driver you can possibly have, as your customers create the trust for new customers. You don't have to do it yourself, which is much harder. Customers really don't care if you're profitable. But if what you sell them can help them become profitable, they'll never want to leave your business. They'll stay on as customers and then probably tell others to become your customers too. 
This is a different version of Balaji's famous quote, win and help win. In this case, it's help win to win. If your customers win in life or business by using your product, you win too, because they will keep using it. Derek Sivers doubles down on this. None of your customers will ask you to turn your attention to expanding. They want you to keep your attention focused on them. It's counterintuitive, but the way to grow your business is to focus entirely on your existing customers. Just thrill them and they'll tell everyone. And you know what's somewhat surprising? Company growth is actually one of the leading causes for business failures. A study done by the Startup Genome Project, which analyzed more than 3,200 high-growth tech startups, found that 74% of those businesses failed, not because of competition or bad business plans, but because they scaled up too quickly. This doesn't just apply to small businesses, but big corporations too, who often slowly but surely destroy themselves through M&A activities, meaning acquiring other companies. Being small means being specific, or even intentionally excluding audiences from your product. Paul Jarvis has a great analogy for this. The pistachio ice cream. People either love it or hate it. As a company of one, you shouldn't target the broadest customer base, but a very specific one instead, to carve out a niche. There are a lot more practical tips in the book on how to start and operate a company of one. Just by writing this video script, I came up with four new video ideas, so expect more of this in the future. It's definitely a subject I'm deeply passionate about and have a lot of ideas on that I want to share. And that's it for this short video. I hope you took something out of it. Quick reminder, you can subscribe to my second channel in case you are interested in building a company, turning a side project into a profitable business, or simply want to listen to my struggles and hopefully some wins. If you enjoyed the video, I would appreciate it if you leave a like and subscribe to this channel for further content, and then I see you next time.